Hey there! Welcome to Archival Adventures. Happy Wednesday. Uh, I was persistent and lucky enough. You can't hear me, can you? Um, one moment. I haven't done that before. Uh, the reason for that, um, I was persistent and lucky enough to manage to get both channels live. Uh, Twitch has been having an outage. Lots of channels have not been able to go live. Um, I managed to get both of the channels that we stream to uh, to read as live. So hopefully that means that somebody out there is seeing this. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, welcome to Wednesday. Uh, it, is, um, it is a day. I, I don't know. It is September 28th, <laughs> Wednesday, and it's time for another adventure in the archives. Uh, I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech, and this is my once a week show where we take a look at a collection, we see what's there, we sort of explore it together. Uh, most times I have no idea what's inside. Um, it's an adventure, we don't know where it's gonna take us. Um, the collection I chose for today is the Samuel Herrick Papers, and I will, uh, I'll talk a little bit about why I picked that for today after we take a look at Virginia Tech's land and uh, land acknowledgement and labor um, recognition. That's the word, um, as we do at the top of every stream. Um, but also, let me say, hi, Key Squared, and hello, Hannah. Um, and as always, the technical setup, the physical setup, slightly different. I'm trying out something so that while I haven't been able to get chat up there for me to see, I have both chats over here in roughly the same area, so hopefully I will be able to see both chats without having to bob side to side. We'll see how it goes. Uh, let me, um, hi Fluid Ann. Yeah, I, I, Hannah, it was, it was interesting. My channel, my, my personal channel went live right away. The library's channel, uh, took a few minutes before I managed to get it to go live. All right, I'm, I'm, we're gonna do the land and labor, or the land acknowledgement and labor recognition um, as we do at the top of every stream. So let me boop over here. Um, so we do this because it's important to pay attention to what the university says on these topics. And um, since they deal with the history of the institution, I think it's especially important to call them out uh, in the archive stream and for me to keep this in mind as I'm picking things 
to consider for collections to share on here. While we don't have a lot, um, I do try to consider this. So Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland, and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices, like the Morrill Act of 1862, enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. Through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Utprosim, that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. Um, there should be some posts going in the chat to just give you all that text if you want to have it. Um, all right. Um, just one second, I have to switch back away from the computer view before I uh, pull up the next screen that we're going to look at. Uh, close, Hannah. There we go. Um, so in a second, I'm going to pull up the finding aid for the collection that we're going to be looking at. Um, I can go ahead and drop that in chat. Uh, I'm not sure where the mods are at today. Um, there, yes. So we're going to be looking at the Samuel Herrick papers. Um, and let me just pull that finding aid up here real quick as I navigate three different technological devices to make all of this work. Uh, I mean, and that's just the one sitting on the table in front of me. Uh, the Samuel Herrick papers covering 1930 to 1974. Um, there is a very particular reason why I selected these papers today, um, and it has to do with a 1951 film called The Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, so we will, we'll get there in just a second, but um, let's talk about who Samuel Herrick is. Uh, Samuel Herrick generally recognized as the founder of the field of astrodynamics. Now this information that is in here was written by the archivist who did the processing. I don't know who it was. It just says Special Collections and University Archives staff. Um, I also don't know, let's see, it was processed. In, it looks like the finding aid was written in 2011. So somebody in 2011 said Herrick is generally recognized as the founder of the field of astrodynamics. If you go out to his Wikipedia entry, it does talk about him being a prominent astrophysicist, uh, but I didn't immediately find anything that says, oh, he's, he's recognized as the founder of this field. So I just wanted to note there, while that's what it says in the finding aid, I haven't dug into that to corroborate it. Uh, born in Madison County, Virginia in 1911, received a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from Williams College in 1932 and a PhD in Astronomy from the University of California at Berkeley in 1936. Um, he taught mostly at UCLA, served as, as an instructor in the Astronomy Department from 37 to 42, and was an assistant professor from 42 to 47 and then associate professor, 47 to 52, and professor from 52 to 62. He was the Hunsaker Professor of Astronomy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology during 61 to 62, and then was made a professor in the astronomy and engineering departments at UCLA in 1962. Um, he died in 74. 
<clears throat> so uh, I think what's more important is the next paragraph, though. His work uh, applied the classic disciplines of celestial mechanics and mathematics to the special problems of space trajectory research. Um, his studies of the celestial mechanics aspects of space navigation date from 1931, when he received advice and encouragement from R.H. Goddard, yes, that Goddard, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, um, named after him. Uh, as early as 1936, he formulated a development program for the utilization of celestial mechanics in the solution of space navigation problems destined to become real problems only two decades later. In 1946, Herrick instituted a course in rocket navigation, the world's first university course designed specifically for astronautics. In 1957, he founded the Astrodynamics Colloquium at UCLA to facilitate communication among scientists engaged in rocket research. Um, many, many, many publications. It says over 200 items. Um, so what's in these papers? Correspondence notes, drafts of publications, files relating to students and courses, and reprints of the works of others in astronomy and space sciences. Uh, other highlights include Herrick's consulting files for NASA's Project Mercury and uh, his consulting on the film The Day the Earth Stood Still, 1951, as well as for private industry. You'll note under arrangement it says, the collection is currently unprocessed. The box level inventory is general and non-inclusive. A printed list of numbered publications from boxes 27 to 33 is available in box one, as well as the electronic version below. The series were imposed for better grouping of materials and are not exact in title. And you'll see, uh, apparently, box 66 is not inventoried, which A lets you know there are at least 66 boxes. Um, uh, the actual size, there are 69 boxes and one oversized folder in this collection. I do not have 69 boxes here in the room with me. Uh, so if you're looking at this finding aid and you see a topic that you want me to try and get to, um, do let me know, but I will let you know right now, uh, unless it has something to do with minor planets, I probably don't have it in the room with me. Um, I, I pulled the stuff on the day the Earth stood still, the stuff on Project Mercury, and the stuff on minor planets as much as possible. I don't have everything on minor planets here in the room. Um, Oh no, I, I've missed some chat. Your library's copy of his big two-volume textbook on rocket navigation is checked out. Good, somebody had to check it out. Oh, yep, key squared. Uh, I, I wondered if that was what your somebody had to, was about. Um, yes, there are 69 boxes. Um, a quite nice number of boxes if you're uh, living on the internet and especially here on Twitch. Um, so if it's something about 20th Century Fox, about the day the Earth stood still, I probably have it. Uh, if it is something about Project Mercury, I probably pulled it. If it is something on Minor Planets, as long as it's not just the published newsletter on Minor Planets, I probably have it. Specifically, I have part of Box 34. I have Box 7, Box 39, 40, 41, 43 and 63 here in the room with me, as well as a couple of additional folders from box two. Um, I, I, I think it would be especially helpful if there was an actual, like if this collection had been fully processed and we had folder by folder telling us what there is. Um, but it's going to be even more of an adventure because I can try to point to a topic and then we have to find it because I don't know specifically which folder it's going to be in which box. Uh, anyway, the reason I ended up picking this collection in the first place was because 71 years ago today, or this week, not today, this week, I can get the actual date. Um, sadly, I did not pull this collection last year when it was 70 years uh but 71 years ago 
Nope, that's not the one I want. Thanks, Google. Come on. Okay, so I'm slightly off in my dates. I swear, when I looked it up, I thought it was this week. But um, 71 years ago this month, uh, The Day the Earth Stood Still um, came out in 1951. Um, technically, it was released on September 18th. So 10 days ago, 71 years ago. But anyway... That was just an excuse for me to pull this collection because somehow I saw The Day the Earth Stood Still um, listed in the um, finding aid. And so I went and looked, okay, when should I feature this collection? Um, and so that is how we ended up with this today. In a uh, wonderful, wonderful convergence of things, wherein I did not know it was a thing, but somehow managed to time it perfectly. As happened when I did the wine labels collection and happened to just be streaming about wine labels on National Wine Drinking Day, um, we're going to be looking at some stuff related to minor planets, which includes asteroids. Just two days after NASA successfully hit an asteroid with a spaceship in an effort to alter its orbit around its neighboring asteroid. And considering that Samuel Herrick was heavily involved in the early parts of the field of astrodynamics, which would be the field used to plot that course for that spaceship to have it intersect with an asteroid and for that matter, just our in plotting of the asteroid's trajectory and how it was going to be altered by that impact, today's a perfect day to be looking at these materials. Um, all right. I, I, with that, I think it's time for us to actually dive in and start looking at some of the stuffs. Um, so how about I switch us over to the document view with the top-down camera here. Also, do let me know, as I said, if you see something in the finding aid and you're just like, this is interesting, uh, let me know. Um, if it's something I physically have in the room, I will be happy to look at it. If it's not something I physically have in the room, I'll make a note of it and we will uh, we'll stream about it another day and, and look at it then. Um, this folder with these materials, you'll, you'll see I have a note. Return to Mark. Uh, this folder and the box it came out of, while this entire collection is in offsite storage, uh, this box, and particularly this folder, basically live on site because this folder gets used for instruction quite a lot. Um, I did not know this uh, because I have never... I had never seen this folder before. Um, this is a folder from box two, simply titled 20th Century Fox. And so we're gonna take a look and see what is in here. Um, you can see it was full of eight and a half by 11 pages, standard um, letter size in the US. I'm going to uh, zoom in probably to page width or roughly there in, uh, yeah, that's too far. There. Hopefully, let's see. Mark, a person, not mark the metadata format. You are correct, key squared. Um, I'm actually going to pull one of these supplemental lights over to try and get a little better lighting on the page because it seems a little dark to me. Um, and because I have them and they're on. <laughs> there. I should maybe have switched to a different view while I did that. But... 
Anyway, it's live. This is essentially like, I don't know, a one person show in, in live theater, only it's about archives and actual history. <clears throat> oh, good. I'm glad it, I'm glad it was worth doing, Key Squared. I thought it looked kind of dark, so, um, all right. We have a couple of things here. This looks like an excerpt from the script itself. Um, uh, appears to start on page 70, but we've got, uh, uh, I say appears to be from the script because these are, uh, this is clearly formatted as a script and we've got Barnhart and Klaatu talking to one another, uh, which would be from the day the earth stood still. Uh, oh gosh, wow, <clears throat> interesting start here. Where we're picking up is, I thought I knew everyone interested in the three-body problem, but I must apologize anyway for my secretary reporting you to General Cutler. I called him and explained that it had to do only with celestial mechanics. I was already trained in that field, you know, and not with my later work, apologetically, that he looks upon as important. It was a clumsy way to introduce myself. I honestly have not seen this movie in a long time. I did not remember to watch it before the stream. So I'm just, you know, giving voice to these lines, but in no way uh, trying to mimic the movie. Oh, Galara Dragon, hello, and how are you today? Um, hi, Shadows of Life. You hope nobody has actually tried to meet everybody studying the three-body problem? It, indeed, it would take a very long time, especially after, uh, uh, is the author's name Shishin Liu? Um, uh, yeah, Shishin Liu, or, well, depending, I guess it's Liu Shishin, uh, wrote the novel, The Three-Body Problem, and introduced it to a lot more people. Um, so anyway, we've got some script here. Uh, Herrick was a science consultant on the 1951 The Day the Earth Stood Still. Um, so what, what is more interesting than lines that you could probably pull up and, yeah, I mean, you could watch the 1951 film and hear them speak these lines rather than me reading them out to you. What's more interesting is the notes from presumably from Herrick, these are his papers, um, taking a break from Twit, you were taking a break, now you're back? Oh, absolutely, Galara. Uh, I'm glad that you're back. I'm glad that I was able to go live today, considering that Twitch was having major outage issues today. Um, and, and, but I managed to get the stream online. Um, so what's more interesting to me is the notes that are on here. And yes, they are blurry. Um, it is pencil and it is, uh, while yes, this is, and uh, this is zoomed in, um, the lines are really sort of that muddy. Yeah, no, it's not just you. It is, it's all across Twitch. Um, channels have had trouble going live. In fact, I go live on, for this show on two channels. One of them went live right away and the other one took me, I think I, I tried going live maybe 20 times before it actually took and, and went live. Yeah, they're having trouble with payment processing too. Um, let's see, so uh, part of Blackboard material, uh, two body, This definitely says two body, not three body. Uh, two body helio center. Helio center. A L L I F S E. No, that doesn't seem to make sense. 
It, it does look like L-L-I-F-S-E, but I don't know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try typing and see what we get. Automatic spell checker is great. Oh, ellipse, E-L-L-I-P-S-E. That makes sense, Helia Center ellipse. Let me see if this is really a thing. Yes. So, uh, two body heliocenter ellipse, or uh, this, what comes up is Copernican heliocentrism, astronomical model developed by Copernicus, in, published in 1543, positioned the sun at the center of the universe, motionless with Earth and the other planets orbiting around it in circular, circular paths. So, um, yeah, key squared. It is ellipse. Um, and so we've got two-body heliocenter ellipse. And then we've got a dotted line here, uh, transitional orbit. Um, and then here we have the two-body geocentric hyperbola. Um, so those are the notations that have been added by Herrick on this page. I'm curious to see what the actual lines in the film were that he's commenting on. Either that or, <clears throat> so this is part of Blackboard material. I have an image uh, that we'll look at in a second, but uh, three body problem has been almost like the weather, everybody talking, nobody doing. It occurred to me that even if we had a solution, it would be only a somewhat better approximation than a two body solution because of the other perturbations, planetary, equatorial bulge, lunar. Why not then seek any approximation that is better than a two body solution, even if only for a limited time and a particular problem? Pointing to the blackboard, such as this transitional orbit for a rocket approaching the earth and use its con constants in place of two-body constants with a variation of parameters technique. Exactly. But those darned integrals, clumsy, aren't they? But when you expand them into series, everything below the ninth order ter terms drops out. But this, I was working on it as you came by. Okay, so uh, like I said, it has been a long time since I saw this film. the things on the blackboard become important, apparently. They are directly discussed, which means that in filmmaking, you want to make sure that what's on the board is what's being talked about. You want to make sure it's accurate and correct and, and that that is what they're talking about is actually reflected on the board. Geocentric hyperbola, path of something whipping around the Earth and accelerating. So that would be like a gravity assist. Sorry, I have a thing on my monitor and I can't tell if it's the... It's in the video. Is it on the camera lens? Hang on, before I do this, um, I'm, I'm, rather than you getting a close-up view of my eye, um, I don't see anything on the camera lens. So I don't know what that artifact is. <laughs> but I will note it for next time. Yeah, mysterious white dot. I don't know what it is. Um, it, I, I looked at the actual camera lens and there's nothing on the camera lens. So I will note it for next time. And, um, the people who actually maintain this equipment, oh, you know, I bet I know what it is. Nope. Ah. There we go. 
I have to remember I'm working in front of a green screen and that anything not green that enters the field of vision of any of the cameras um, will then be visible. <laughs> I have solved it. Uh, anyway, I said I had an image. This is the blackboard in question. Uh, and you can see, don't touch, don't erase. Uh, so this is from 20th Century Fox, from the filming, um, the actual like mathematical equations on the blackboard um, that you'll see if you actually watch the movie. Uh, and this is not people from the movie. Well, one of them is. Um, on the left is Samuel Herrick, the science consultant, who presumably is the person who wrote the equations on the board. On the right is Michael Rennie, um, who, I, before I actually like say something incorrect, um, I'm just going to double check. which part he played. Uh, yes, I, it's, it's the one I thought he played, but um, yes, on the right is Michael Rennie, who played Klaatu in the 1951 The Day the Earth Stood Still. Herrick looks very distinguished. Um, and so uh, this is behind the scenes image from the filming of the 1951 the day the earth stood still. Um, and if, if any of you are familiar, there is a Twitch streamer. Um, I, I don't know that I've seen her channel go live anytime recently, um, but uh, if you're familiar with Dr. Erin Mack um, and, and her channel, she is a science consultant for the Star Trek, uh, like all of, the currently in production Star Trek series is. Um, and so uh, Herrick would have been sort of filling the same role with regard to this movie, um, letting them know if they're getting the science right, or in this case, making sure that the uh, scientific problem that is being discussed in the script is accurately reflected on the blackboard that the actors are supposed to be gesturing at and referring to in their lines. Um, does what again? Oh, touches the blackboard? Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, so what we have here, and where is, aha. Uh -huh. We have the signed photo. There is a letter. If I can find it. There's a letter that came with the photo that I know I've seen that I am not seeing that in all likelihood, if it is not physically here, is somewhere in my office. But where and why is it not here? Um, ah, here it is. It's like, I know it should be in here. So we have the image and what we have to accompany it, a letter from 20th Century Fox Film Corporation dated uh, June 5th, 1951. Dear Sam, or not dear, sorry, I'm not there yet. Addressed to uh, Dr. Samuel Herrick in Los Angeles. Um, Dear Dr. Herrick, we are delighted to enclose two photographs of you and Michael Rennie, one of which has been autographed by him. Mary and I are waiting anxiously for the birth of our second child, although her doctor recognized every indication of immediate birth during her visit last Friday. Many good wishes, Ralph Wycott Jr. Um, <laughs> hi, Lord Portico. <laughs> I hope that your work call went well. Um, 
we are looking at the Samuel Herrick papers today. Uh, Herrick was a science consultant on the 1951 film The Day the Earth Stood Still, um, which turned 71 years old this month, about 10 days ago. And also, uh, he did a lot of work with astrodynamics and regarding minor planets. Uh, minor planets being things like moons and asteroids. So, considering NASA's DART uh, project that just uh, had its major events happen two days ago, perfect timing for this collection. Uh, but yeah, the finding aid is, is there if you want to take a look and if you see anything that you particularly want me to highlight, let me know. But also just good to see you. Um, so uh, the letter from the studio saying, hey, we've got two copies of this photo for you, one of them signed, and then providing what to me is too much information about uh, his wife's pregnancy. But I don't honestly know how close Ralph Wycott Jr. and Samuel Herrick were. It just seemed like this was a business letter and that that was TMI. Uh, just personal observation there. <laughs> yes, we declared war on a space object. Oh, does that mean it was the, a Star War? Um, anyway. <laughs> Uh, May 24th, 1951. So the, that first letter was June 5th. Now we're going back in time. May 24th, 1951. Dear Dr. Herrick, thank you for your letter and for your statement of services um, on which our enclosed check is based. I am sorry that I did not see you during your last visit to the studio. I apparently missed you at the stage, but only a few minutes. I genuinely enjoyed our association with you. I hope you will derive some satisfaction from your contribution to The Day the Earth Stood Still When You See It. Sincerely, Ralph Wycott Jr. <laughs> oh dear. Were there shenanigans? Uh, thank you for the points, Lord Portico. Um, hi. Thank you, keyboard. Everything's doing weird things today. Um, Moobot. What are you doing, Moobot? <laughs> I mean, it, it is good timing considering uh, that Galara is in chat, but Moobot is... is throwing information about um, a video game that I play on a different day of the week. I don't know why. I don't know why that, that command is broken because it should not be popping into today's chat. Um, a few days before that, on May 14th, 1951, we have a letter from um, George Wasson with legal counsel at 20th Century Fox Film Corporation. Dear Dr. Herrick, we enclose, forth with, or we enclose here with for your records. Hey, perfect timing, Lord Portico. It's a letter from a lawyer. We enclose here with for your records one fully executed agreement between us dated April 5, 1951, covering your services in connection with our motion picture now entitled The Day the Earth Stood Still. Yours very truly, 20th Century Fox Film Corporation by George Wasson, legal counsel. Uh, and we've got a note that there's one enclosure. <laughs> a lawyer definitely wrote that. Um, and then the next thing we have is April 5th, 1951, the legal agreement, which we're, it's, it seems fairly short, so we're gonna look at it. Uh, Dear Dr. Herrick, this letter will confirm our understanding and agreement with respect to certain technical advice and information rendered and to be rendered by you to us upon the following terms and conditions. This is when uh, reading terms and conditions can be fun. Yeah, translation. Here's the signed agreement for the day the earth stood still. Yeah. Uh, one. 
you agree to advise and inform us in matters of astrophysics and celestial mechanics, in connection with our motion picture production tentatively entitled The Day the Earth Stood Still. At such time or times convenient to you, as we may desire your services, it being understood that uh, that the within agreement may be terminated at any time by either party hereto, subject to the provisions of paragraph 2a hereof, 2a, it is mutually agreed that you will render your services hereunder for a period of six and two-third days at the rate of compensation here and after mentioned. Okay, so consulting for six and two-thirds days, which is a very bizarre number to me, but okay. Um... B, we agree to pay you, uh, we agree to pay to you as your entire compensation here under the sum of $75 per day for each eight hour day during which you render your services for us in the foregoing capacity. For any period less than one day, your compensation shall be computed on the basis that one hour equals one eighth of one day. So two-thirds would be, what even is two-thirds of eight? Yes, terms and conditions. What is two-thirds of eight? 5.333, thank you very much, person who wrote the legal agreement. Uh, I I'm just going to extend that sarcastic thank you from the people in the payroll office who have to calculate what portion of $75 gets paid out for 5.3333333333333 hours. <gasps> Just really? Sorry, I, having worked in, um, I, I have previously worked in a portion of human resources where we regularly had to compute uh, compensation numbers on infinite regression. And it was always a problem. <laughs> Hi, dearie. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to think of the math. Uh, so, two thirds of eight. Um, times, or, yeah. No, I want divided by, not times. Ah, caps lock does not help me highlight something. No, 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 no. I don't know why I'm trying to do this math. I am not a maths person. I think it comes out to actually really cleanly at four hundred dollars. But uh, so so maybe they were actually kind. No, it's not 400. It can't be 400. No, it's because it's $75 per day. So it's not 400. It is 14 something. No. Okay, key squared. That makes perfect sense. They just wanted to say $500. Um, it makes perfect sense. If it's $75 a day, two thirds of a day would be $50. But what they said was not that you'll get $75 for each full day and for your two thirds day, you'll get two thirds of the $75, meaning $50. What they said <laughs> that it was that for the day that you're working 5.33333 hours, uh, your pay will be compensated assuming that one hour equals one-eighth of one day. 
So each of the five hours, you would get one eighth of seventy-five dollars, and then you've got point three 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 hours in which you need to take the remaining. <laughs> Lawyers do not equal accountants. So uh, one eighth of 75. So each hour on that last day is nine dollars and thirty seven and a half cents. So you've got five times that. We're, we're doing maths now. Uh, oh, I need my Wolfram <laughs> so I could do my, I use Wolfram Alpha for, for this kind of thing. Um, all right, five times, come on, uh, one eighth, um, times 75. All right. So for the five hours, uh, you end up with $46.87.5. But then you have 0.33333 repeating hours that you need to compensate. Point. Three, 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 three. I don't know how to enter the repeating, but that comes out to three dollars and almost uh, twelve and almost a half cent. They just the way they wrote it is very, very makes it very difficult to figure out exactly to the penny how much money they're actually going to compensate because if what they wanted was to say that you were getting $50 for that day, they should have just said you're getting $50 for that day rather than saying you get uh, an amount that is calculated, computed on the basis that one hour equals one eighth of one day. The way this is written means that there's complicated maths that have to be brought in to determine how much you get for that three quarters day. Um, you're, <laughs> they just want to torment us all. Now wondering uh, if whoever wrote the contract has a relative in the bookkeeping office who wanted the overtime that week. <laughs> yeah, and, and yeah, I don't know what the laws would have said at the time. And so maybe this language is written specifically to conform to what they were supposed to be at the time. It's just um, provides a level of complication to the compensation uh, that probably didn't need to be there. Anyway, C, the parties here too acknowledge that at the date of the within agreement, you have rendered your services for us here under for a total period of six days and that we have heretofore paid to you in full compensation for your services during such a period, such period of six days, uh, the sum of $450. The parties here too agree that such period of six days shall be included in the computation of the period of six and two third days set forth in paragraph two, or two A hereof. So, I find it really interesting that the agreement was provided after six days of work had already been done and when there was only two thirds of a day of work remaining in the contract. It's, yeah, it's backdated. So this contract is covering work already done uh, plus three quarters of a day yet to be done. Um, <clears throat> three, 
you agree that we and our licensees may freely use in any manner we may desire in connection with the production, distribution, exhibition, advertising, and or exploitation of motion pictures, television, radio, and other pre presentations, all information and material furnished by you to us hereunder and in consideration of the within agreement you do hereby assign to us all non-exclusive or the non-exclusive right to use and to license others to use all of such information and material for the uses and purposes here and above set forth it is agreed however that we shall be under no obligation to use any of the information or material furnished by you to us hereunder honestly a fairly standard paragraph i think uh just reading it uh, I would expect this in pretty much any motion picture contract. Um, it, it's basically, hey, I provided you with information and, um, or you provided us with information and in so doing, you're giving us the right to use that information for the movie, for the promotion of the movie, uh, and for any forms this movie might take in the future, whether it be played over radio or beamed into outer space via holographic mental telepathy. Uh, it's a basically whatever form possible, we can use it, we can transfer the rights to our subsidiaries and anybody else that we want to distribute it. Um, but also, we don't have to use any of the stuff that you gave us. Uh, that seems fairly standard. Four, nothing herein contained shall be construed as creating the relation of employer and employee between the parties here too, but you shall at all times be deemed to be an independent contractor. Uh, so independent contractor agreement, we're pretty familiar with those these days. Um, this, that paragraph is so that they uh, basically don't have to provide any of the other required benefits that an employer would have to provide to an employee, such as healthcare. Um, and honestly, for six, six days of work, it's not surprising that they would want to not provide healthcare. Uh, since that is typically a benefit provided to full-time employees. Um, kindly confirm our understanding and agreement with respect to the four to the foregoing by your signature below. Very truly yours, 20th Century Fox Film Corporation. Um, by its executive manager, Studio Treasurer. No, oh, it, interesting. It was originally typed by its executive manager and executive manager has been crossed through and uh, Studio Treasurer has been filled in instead and then there's the signature. I don't know who the Studio Treasurer was at the time. Uh, it looks like possibly F, F.L. Metzer, uh, but, or Metzler, possibly. Um, but honestly, signatures are notoriously difficult to, to make out what they actually say. Uh, and if I needed to know, I could always go and look up who the studio treasurer was in 1951. Um, but my best guess is F.L. Metzler. Um, and then accepted, Dr. Samuel Herrick. <laughs> makes a lot more sense for having a physicist for a week than it does for say a driver for several years indeed key squared um and holographic mental telepathy is some techno babble yeah yeah complete total techno babble so anyway six days consulting on the picture samuel herrick uh presumably provided the mathematical equations that are on the chalkboard um, and helped Michael Rennie to be comfortable with them so that he could embody Klaatu uh, because Klaatu needed to be able to believably interact with these scientific equations um, as a very, very smart being from another planet. Uh, so the signature on here is to Samuel Herrick um, oh gosh, I know what it says. I've figured out what it says multiple times. Um, I need to look up what it says or I'm going to take many, 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 many minutes figuring it out again. Uh, because it, 
took me a long time to figure out. Uh, I'm sure one of you is going to get it like right off the bat. But um, to Samuel Herrick, my sincerest wishes, Michael Rennie. Yes, indeed, it does say my sincerest wishes. And it was really, really difficult for me to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, I, my sincerest wishes, part of the reason it took a while to figure out is it doesn't sound like a full sentence. It is not a common best wishes, etc., but it definitely says sincerest wishes. Uh, and it, it, figuring it out relied on um, the M in Michael Rennie, because I knew this said Michael Rennie, M, M. And then this clearly starts with an S because Samuel is right above, and the S is the same form. Um, and yeah, it, it was just, it was really difficult. And like this doesn't seem like it would be a W, but it is because that was the only word that fit. Wait, what is Mubot doing now? Mubot, it is not Monday. What are you doing, Mubot? Is the, is the stream information wrong? No, we're on talk shows and podcasts, which is what we're supposed to be on. That's really strange. Uh, thank you for looking into that, Portico, because I, I have no idea why, um, why it's throwing all the games comments for every other day that I stream on, on that channel. Um, oh, and on the back, uh, somebody has written, Dr. Herrick with Michael Rennie, movie The Day the Earth Stood Still. Anyway. <laughs> um, wow. We spent more time on the movie than I thought we were going to, but I'm okay with that. It is the reason I ended up pulling this in the first place. Um, there are some other things in here. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Financial consideration. Reasons for us insufficient. Remuneration, $75 per day, $25 per hour. Insufficient indicates lack of appreciation. Only person in country for part of it. Bone style, good for planets. I, I'm really... This is like internal reasoning from 20th Century Fox as to why they're paying uh, Herrick the amount that they're paying. And I'm very, very curious as to why Herrick has that information. <laughs> Thank you, Portico. <laughs> you found some vintage postcards with my sincerest wishes. You guess it was a common, if ungrammatical, phrase at one point. Hugo girl, I suppose. Yeah, uh, just as confusing. And then we have timesheet. Um, so some of this information here, we've got the mathematical formula. I presume, I don't know, and I'm just gonna, is this the formula that is on the...
Uh, I don't exactly see an exact match. I would be surprised if part of this isn't on here somewhere. It's just I'm not seeing exactly where it matches at. So it was just my assumption that mathematical formula in the folder would be the one in the photo. But uh, more of the script scene where they're looking at the... Um, just want to see what else is in here because I've got a little bit off to the side here that is also somewhat interesting. Most of this is just like schedule and May 22nd, 1951, Mr. Ralph Wycott Jr. Dear Ralph, apparently the legal department overlooked your intent to close out the matter, so I am forwarding the enclosed. I appreciated you remembering my interest in Barnhart's study and was pleased to feel that uh, I earned my visit by correcting misapprehensions as to the spirit of the script as well as mistakes on the blackboard and in line. Um, unbefuddling poor Klaatu was quite necessary. Shall, shall hope to see you before long. Yours sincerely, Sam Herrick. I think that has got to be my favorite line ever in any archives thing that I have ever looked at. Unbefuddling poor Klaatu was quite necessary. <laughs> the gravitational force equation on the top left of the second page was on the middle bottom of the board in one of the stills key squared. I'm amazed that you're able to catch that. So they did use some of it. This is... I, I'm gonna... After stream, I'm going to have to, like, I'm going to have to photocopy this letter to put on my wall just so I have unbefuddling poor Klaatu was quite necessary um, as a keepsake because I, I find that just to be wildly hilarious um, and just a gem. <laughs> unbefuddling. That's what education is all about. Indeed, Key Squared. Indeed. Um, dear Mr. Blonstein, your amusement and interest the other day in our trade journals led me to think you might enjoy the enclosed bulletin and its pre-review of When Worlds Collide. The Pacific Rocket Society uh, publishes also a somewhat more dignified journal, Pacific Rockets. A word more on my hope that you will consider bathing your flying saucer in light. Uh, from my point of view, it will have the effect of obscuring the mechanical features of the device. Uh, it as the external manif manifestations that may be taken as indicating a specific and questionable uh, way in which thrust is being applied. There would be less possibility of question if only a suggestion of a jet of light emerged from a ball of light. The light would be dismissed as an external and incidental manifestation of atomic or other forces at work within the vehicle. And from your point of view, what is more awe-inspiring than what is more awe-inspiring than fire or a lightning flash or a ball of light? Uh, but I shall now retire and look forward with interest to questions I can answer. Yours sincerely, Sam Herrick. I love that there's consultation in here about um, how best to depict a flying saucer. Uh, 
Um, yeah, this is this is really neat. Uh, this is this is what initially made me want to pull this collection. Uh, so I have no problem spending tons of time on it. October 16, 1951. Mr. Elia Kazan. Um, that name is vaguely familiar to me. Uh, does that ring bells for other people? American film and theater director, producer, screenwriter, and actor. Uh, looking for like, what are what particularly known for? Let's see. A Tree Grows in Brooklyn, a, The Sea of Grass, Boomerang, Gentleman's Agreement, Pinky, Panic in the Streets, A Streetcar Named Desire, uh, Viva Zapata, Man on a Tightrope, On the Waterfront, East of Eden, Baby Doll, A Face in the Crowd, Wild River, Splendor in the Grass, America, America, The Arrangement, The Visitors, and The Last Tycoon um, are the... Filmography there. Big time director. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Elia Kazan. Dear Kazan. Interestingly, dear Kazan. Um, perhaps you will remember vaguely our conversation a while back that touched briefly on Williams and on interplanetary rockets. It has occurred to me that I should send you the enclosed reprint, which you may find readable in parts. No idea. I don't have the enclosure. I just have the letter. Anyway. That was a fun folder. That was one folder out of 69 boxes worth of material. Um, oh, I've got pages backwards. Hang on. Aha! There we go. So. That was the only folder uh, that I am aware of about the day the earth stood still. The other thing that I wanted to look at, the other thing that I was interested in in this collection was stuff about minor planets. Because I was like, what are minor planets? Um, so we'll get to that in a second. I did, as I was pulling out things, trying to fit stuff on the cart to bring up today, because there's no way 69 boxes were going to come up here. I didn't even pull them all out of storage. But I pulled more boxes than would fit on the cart that I bring up. I came across this folder labeled R.H. Goddard. And if you don't know, Uh, <clears throat> I will read you just a little bit of information about Robert Hutchings Goddard. This is coming from the Wikipedia article. Great place for basic primer information if you just need a quick, what is this thing? Um, Wikipedia is great for that. Uh, Robert Hutchings Goddard was an American engineer, professor, physicist, and inventor who is credited with creating and building the world's first liquid-fueled rocket. Goddard successfully launched his rocket on March 16, 1926, which ushered in an era of spaceflight and innovation. He and his team launched 34 rockets between 1926 and 1941, achieving al altitudes as high as 2.6 kilometers, 1.6 miles, and speeds as fast as 885 kilometers per hour, 550 miles per hour. 
Uh, Goddard's work as both both theorist and ed and engineer antis. Let me try that again. Goddard's work as both as both theorist and engineer anticipated many of the developments that would make spaceflight possible. He can be called the man who ushered in the space age. Two of Goddard's 214 patented inventions, a multi-stage rocket and a liquid fuel rocket, were important milestones toward spaceflight. His 1919 monograph, A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes, is considered one of the classic texts of the 20th century rocket science. Um, Uh, although his work was revolutionary, he received little public support, moral or monetary. Um, years after his death, at the dawn of the space age, Goddard came to be recognized as one of the founding fathers of modern rocketry, um, along with Esnol uh, Peltelli, uh, Tsiolkovsky, and Oberth. Um, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center was named in Goddard's honor in 1959. So, that's who Goddard is. Uh, Portico, thank you. I will, I will uh, hydrate. I will have a little bit of water to drink. So, from what I can tell, this is one of the correspondence folders. And I did note at the beginning of stream, um, this collection is unprocessed. We have uh, brief overview summaries for each box to say what's inside. We, and everything has been re rehoused. So everything is in a folder that is an archival quality folder. But we don't have folder level description, which is how we usually process things. We usually have at least folder level description to help locate things. I mean, this one, the folder would just say Goddard, comma, RH as the title. Um, but I believe this is ultimately part of the correspondence. And this is a copy of a letter. Uh, because sometimes people hand wrote like a second copy of their letter for themselves. Um, and that's the only reason we have this. Uh, July 9th, 1931, Professor Robert H. Goddard, Rockwell, no, Roswell, sorry, New Mexico. Um, Dear Dr. Goddard, I've been trying for some months to write to you, but have but have been deterred by a fear that you have no time to give to unknown correspondence. My need for your advice has, however, impelled me to brave that fear and to beg that you will share a few minutes for a consideration of my letter. Spare a few minutes for a consideration of my letter. In a year, I shall be graduated from college so that now is not too early to decide whether or not I am to devote my life as I wish, uh, as I wish to, to the development of rockets and rocket navigation. And in so, and if so, sorry, to find how I may best accomplish that end. Uh, it is no passing fancy with me. For years I have considered the problem. At first, I must confess, because of its romantic appeal to a boyish imagination. Now, however, my interest, having grown the stronger with increasing knowledge and years of study, is, I believe, an intelligent and practical one. I know that you have put interplanetary flights out of your mind for the present, being interested rather in exploring the upper atmosphere. Uh, but am I not right in believing that you look upon the rocket as a potential means of transportation, if not in space, at least for long distances on Earth? Ahem. <clears throat> 
Of the study of rockets in general, and of your experiments, in particular, I shall not try to show how much or how little I know. Only protest that my ideas are not half-baked, but the result of all the information I have been able to pick up. For me, I must turn, or like, sorry, for more I must turn to you. What I would ask of you is simply an interview to help me decide my future for you are the only man in America to whom I can turn for advice in my chosen field. Perhaps you will be in the East during the summer or fall, or I shall be only too happy if you will let me come out to New Mexico to see you. Possibly you can use me this summer. Uh at any kind of work in connection with your experiences. I should not ask for pay, though naturally I should like, if possible, to earn at least a part of my expenses or, of travel. Uh, at any event, I hope that you will see fit to give me some little encouragement in this matter, which means so much to me. I think that Dr. W.J. William, professor of astronomy at Williams College, it might be Millen, M-I-L-L-A-N, not William, Dr. W. W. L. Millen, professor of astronomy at Williams College, I'm not sure. Uh, will I'm not sure what this word is will blank that I am a serious and intelligent student um Wow, I don't know what that word is, uh, it, it, but meaning, con context clues tell me the meaning should be something like avow or confirm, but I can't make out what letters, I, I don't know what word that is. I just, I can't make it out. Uh, but anyway, I, I think that was a really neat letter of writing to Goddard and saying, I want to study rockets. I'm interested in this, but I need your advice as to whether I should actually go into this field. Um, Williams College Planetarium is named for the late professor Willis Meham, M-I-H-A-M, -M, astronomy professor. Thank you, Key Squared. That is very helpful. Uh, we have a letter here, March 4, 1932. Dear Mr. Herrick, I expect to go east later in the spring, probably in April or May, but I do not yet know exactly when. I shall keep you in mind for an interview, if it can be arranged, but must make clear beforehand that I cannot promise that it will be very satisfactory to you. As I have already explained, my work on the rocket subject is not yet complete, and until it is ready for publication, I do not feel it advisable to discuss it to discuss it in detail. Uh, thanking you for your continued interest, I am very truly yours, R.H. Goddard. Amazing. Uh, another letter, June 5th, 1932. Dear Mr. Herrick, I attended a meeting of the advisory committee having charge of the rocket research in which I have been engaged and planned to arrange an interview with you directly afterwards. I regret to say that my time was so fully occupied that I did not have the opportunity. Owing to the depression, the rocket project is being discontinued July 1st, and the matter of its being resumed later is an uncertain one. I cannot help feeling that a theoretical investigation such as you mention has advantages over experimentation during such times as these. My plans are at present a bit uncertain, but I expect to be in Worcester, Massachusetts 
I don't know why I stumbled there, in Worcester, Massachusetts after the first week in August, so that if you are still in the East at that time, a conference may be arranged. A letter addressed to me in care of the physics department of Clark University will reach me. Thanking you very much for your continued interest in the work. I am, very truly yours, R.H. Goddard. Direct reference to the Depression. July 13, 1931. Uh, Dear Mr. Herrick, the scientific development of rockets is so new that there are, so far as I know, no courses given anywhere on the subject. Possibly the mechanical engineering courses at MIT or the, Califor or the California Tech are the next best thing. Uh, but I doubt if either institution deals with rocket developments directly. The work I am carrying on here in New Mexico is of a very special sort and requires special training. Nearly all the men who are here were brought with me from Worcester uh, where they had been engaged in the same line of work with me for some time. The interplanetary side of the matter is a fascinating one, but it is almost hopeless to expect any serious progress in this direction until high rocket flights have been obtained in the atmosphere. Popular interest is keen on the subject at the present time, but skepticism will continue to be strong until impressive results have been obtained. Uh, the entire field is so new that I hardly feel equal to giving advice. I shall, however, be glad to keep you in mind in case developments arise which make possible my giving suggestions to you. Appreciating your interest in writing, I am very truly yours, R.H. Goddard. <laughs> Sorry, I, these are... I, this is... The guy that the Goddard Space Flight Center was named after. I, just, these, he wrote inside these letters and it's... I might like space. I might be a fan of, of like NASA people and space people, and the fact that NASA named a whole building after him because of his work on rocketry, just, I don't know very much about him. I know he worked on rockets, but I'm still excited by this. Uh, Dear Mr. Herrick, I cannot see that you could gain much by a trip to New Mexico just now. The work I am carrying on has not reached a complete stage, and I do not therefore feel that I am in a position to make statements based upon it as I cannot be certain these statements will be true. Even any predictions I might make as to the future of rocket investigations in general must necessarily be of a very tentative nature until more results have been secured. Perhaps the best plan would be for you to see me when I come east next March, as I may at that time be better able to make definite statements. Very truly yours, R.H. Goddard. Just so many letters. Uh, we have a letter here signed by Mrs. Robert H. Goddard, whose name appears to be Esther. June 9th, 1962, Dear, or, dear Dr. Herrick, addressed to uh, Dr. Samuel Herrick at MIT, recently I found the following entry in my husband's diary. Tuesday, July 18, 1933, took photos of apparatus in AM. Mr. Herrick, student of astronomy in University of California, called in PM and asked about orbit of a rocket to Mars. I imagine my husband was pleased to have a caller with such advanced ideas. There were not many in those days. Sincerely, Esther C. Goddard. That's a great note. I, I, I just... She didn't know Herrick. I presume this was after Goddard's death. Um, I would have to double check to be sure, but uh, actually I can do that. I still have the entry up. Um, yes, so this is like 20 years after he died. And she just happened to be going through his diary and came across an entry that mentioned Herrick. And so she wrote a note to Herrick. That's just awesome. <clears throat> okay, I, I'm just like...
a little starstruck by the names that are showing up in here. Uh, May 12th, 1966, Dr. Werner von Braun, director, George C. Marshall Space Flight Center, Huntsville, Alabama. Dear Dr. von Braun, I enclose herewith my acceptance of your kind invitation to be a member of the International Sponsors Committee for the Robert Hutchings Goddard Library Program. My apology for its delay and my congratulations on the success already achieved by the committee. I am, more I, I am the more pleased to join the committee because Dr. Goddard generously took time to write me four letters when I was a senior at Williams College in 1931 and 1932. I drove by Worcester to see him about three years later and have always been grateful to him for the encouragement he gave me in my studies of celestial mechanics, which were aimed at the rocket problem from the very beginning. My best wishes to you for this and all your endeavors. Yours most sincerely, Samuel Herrick. Professor of Astronomy and Engineering. That's a copy of the letter from his wife. Okay, I'm going to stop reading these letters because I could literally spend the rest of the time just reading through these letters um, related to Goddard, but there were other things to look at as well. Uh, so I'm going to force myself to stop and actually pay attention to some of the minor planets and stuff. Um, Mostly because I said I would, and also because, um, as I said earlier this week, there was some lovely news as NASA tried to alter the orbit of a minor planet. Um, so this folder is Icarus uh, Betulia 1620 Geographos Minor Planets. I need a definition of what the heck is a minor planet? Um, hello, finding aid. Give me assistance. Uh, Because there's multiple mentions of minor planets in the finding aid, and there was a like a organization or something that is mentioned. I don't know. So there are these minor planet circulars. Do 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 do. Uh, not meaning that the planets are circular, just that there was a newsletter of sorts about minor planets um, that we apparently have numerous copies of in this collection. Um, but like, what the heck is a minor planet? Uh, I presume it is some sort of classification that is no longer in use today since we had um, redefinitions of what is a planet, what is a dwarf planet, um, when Pluto was demoted from planet status to dwarf planet status. Uh, but there's mention in here of the Minor Planet Center. And there's a website for such a place. Um, I'm presently looking at a website, minorplanetcenter.net. Um, <clears throat> the International Astronomical Union Minor Planet Center. The single worldwide location for receipt and distribution of positional measurements of minor planets, comets, and outer irregular natural satis satellites of the major planets. The MPC is responsible for the identification, designation, and orbit computation for all of these objects. This involves maintaining the master files of observations and orbits, keeping track of the discoverer of each object, and announcing discoveries to the rest of the world via electronic circulars and an extensive website. The MPC operates at the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory under the auspices of Division F of the International Astronomical Union. All of the MPC's operating funds come from a NASA Near-Earth Object Observations Program grant. Much of the computer equipment that the MPC uses was provided by the Tamkin Foundation. Um, what is a minor planet, though? 
interessante. Um, well, I suppose we explore and find out. Uh, when I looked up the term minor planet, I was pointed to a Wikipedia article um, that is a redirect for planetoid. Minor planet is an astronomical object in direct orbit around the sun, or more broadly any star with a planetary system, that is exclusively classified as neither a planet nor a comet. Before 2006, the International Astronomical Union officially used the term minor planet, but that year's meeting reclassified minor planets and comets into dwarf planets and small solar system bodies. Minor planets include asteroids, near-Earth objects, Mars crossers, and main belt asteroids, and Jupiter trojans, uh, as well as distant minor planets, centaurs, and trans-Neptunian objects, most of which reside in the Kuiper Belt and the Scattered Disk. As of May 2022, there are 1,131,201 known objects, divided into 611,678 numbered secured discoveries and 500,000, or sorry, 519,523 unnumbered minor planets, with only five of those officially recognized as a dwarf planet. The first minor planet to be discovered was Ceres in 1801. The term minor planet has been used since the 19th century to describe these objects. The term planetoid has also been used, especially for larger planetary objects such as those the IAU has called dwarf planets since 2006. Historically, the terms asteroid, minor planet, and planetoid have more or less been synonymous. The term, this terminology has become more complicated by the discovery of numerous minor planets beyond the orbit of Jupiter, especially trans-Neptunian objects that are generally not considered asteroids. A minor planet seen releasing gas may be duly classified as a comet. Okay, so hopefully that is as clear as mud. The mud uh, that you might find on a minor planet if it got too close to the sun. Um, Okay, uh, I have missed some chat, but also, let's see. Also, because space is cool, indeed. Asteroid big enough to be a ball, Ceres, etc. Uh, basically orbits the sun and isn't a major planet or a comet. Indeed, key squared, you are accurate. Sort of a catch-all term. Inner solar system and not a Kuiper belt. Well, so according to what we just learned, uh, technically Kuiper belt objects would be minor planets as well. And, and Hannah has a direct quote from the Wikipedia that I was just reading. Uh, yes, the Minor Planet Center is still a thing. <clears throat> You're old enough to remember when MPC meant multimedia personal computer? Oh dear. Um, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory is not in DC with the rest of the Smithsonian. It's near Boston. I did not know that, Key Squared which randomly you learned from a book on computer security. You never know where you're going to find things. Anyway, uh, so Icarus, Betulia, and 1620 Geographos. Um, feel free to drop information in chat about any of those minor planets, um, and I will happily read it out, but I'm just going to read the things that are in the collection instead of going and looking more things up uh, at the moment. This article, this is a photocopied article, clearly, um, and it's on, uh, it's on heat reactive paper, um, which could easily, all this information on this page could easily get lost if this page ever got too hot. Um, because it is, it is heat sensitive paper and too much heat, direct exposure to sunlight uh, would turn this entire page black. If you've ever had a receipt from a store uh, that you left in your car and it turned black, it was the same kind of paper. Uh, and heat will just activate it and that's how they actually get the printing on there is, is heat. Um, uh, 
Yeah, yeah, like leaving a receipt on a dashboard. It's that kind of paper. Anyway, uh, the date on this. This is from the Boston Globe in 1962, Sunday, November 12th, page A8. And the headline catches my attention here specifically because the complex orbital mechanics and, and astrodynamics uh, required to launch an item from Earth more than a year ago and have it impact with an, a, a tiny little asteroid, uh, what was it called, Dimorphos, I think was the name of it. Um, hi, Cy Eryx. <laughs> the, um, uh, to have it impact with uh, Dimorphos more than a year later when the thing it was impacting is half the size of the Eiffel Tower. That is some serious math work. Um, uh, I'm just going to pull up. Oh. <laughs> okay, if you've not done so, um, I encourage you all to Google, actually using the Google website, um, NASA DART. N-A-S-A -A space D-A-R-T. They have a cute little animation um, that they have programmed in. It, that, was, that was totally worth it. Um, anyway, I was, I, I was going there to look up the name of, uh, yes, Dimorphos, the minor planet moon of the asteroid Didymos. So what they actually aimed at, the, the double asteroid redirection test, the um, ship that was launched, the probe that was launched from Earth in November of 2021, successfully struck Dimorphos, which was a moon around an asteroid. It was very small. And, and the comparison that I remember reading was that it was about half the size of the Eiffel Tower. Um, and they successfully calculated a proper trajectory. They did the orbital mechanics right. They launched it from Earth and it successfully hit its target. Um, so the headline here, space shot accuracy vital at start. A hair off on way to Mars could mean 30,000 miles by Donald White. Suppose you were in a spacecraft headed toward Mars, and suppose for some reason your vehicle was just a bit off course at takeoff, say a foot per second of velocity. You would miss Mars by 30,000 miles. This article from 1962 is directly relevant to understanding the amazing feat that NASA achieved on Monday when their probe hit Dimorphos. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing. I was just, it struck me as I opened the folder and literally relevant to Monday's events. Um, all right, a letter here to Dr. J.M. Joshi at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay. Dear Dr. Joshi, enclosed as per your request is a copy of our hourly ephemeris of Icarus. If you require additional information, please feel free to let me know. Yours most sincerely, Samuel Herrick. Hourly ephemeris of Icarus. Um, let's see. I don't know that we actually have the enclosure, uh, but we can find out more about Icarus. Uh, also termed ninth, or 1566 Icarus, a large near-Earth object of the Apollo group and the lowest numbered potentially, hazard, potentially hazardous asteroid. Extremely eccentric orbit and measures approximately 1.4 kilometers in diameter. In 1968, it became the first asteroid ever observed by radar. 
Its orbit brings it closer to the Sun than Mercury and further out than the orbit of Mars, which also makes it a Mercury, Venus, and Mars crossing asteroid. Uh, all right, a letter to Dr. H.M. Jeffries, Mount Hamilton, California. Apparently he's an astronomer. Somebody has written that on in pencil. I do not know when that was added. Um, Dear Dr. Jeffries, Icarus is better located for observations uh, from northern observatories this year than it has been for several years past. I wonder if you or one of your associates would be good enough to try to get him for me. Uh, ephemeris and closed. Best, best wishes. Sincerely, Sam Herrick. Uh, Astronomical Institute of the Slovak Academy of Sciences at uh, Sklonte Pleso. The following positions of the minor planet number 1620 Geographos have been measured from plates exposed with 30 centimeter F5 astrograph of the observatory Sklonte Pleso. Observed and measured by Milan Antal, 1969. And we have, uh, I don't know what UT is. I know this is ARC and this is declension, but what is UT? What does that stand for? If anybody knows, I will also just try to look it up. But. Uh, no, I don't want University of Texas. That's not the UT I need. I need the abbreviation. What does the abbreviation UT mean? Um, Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know what UT stands for. So if anybody does know, I would appreciate it if you would clarify, because I know ARC, I know declension, but I don't know what UT stands for there. Um, every observation uh, was reduced on the basis of 9 to 11 reference stars from SAO catalog at the positions designated. Measurements of the minor planet was difficult. 1970 observations. Uh, ephemeris for Betulia, 1580, for the November 19, 1961 opposition. Due to an oversight on our part, the ephemeris was not sent to the Minor Planet Center for publication. Uh, we would appreciate any observations you might make, and we would like to improve the orbit before Betulia's close approach in May 1963. Um, I should actually look up 1620 Geographos? I, I don't know this one, because I don't know any of them. But uh, 1620 Geographos. Uh, provisional designation 1951RA is a highly elongated stony asteroid near Earth object and potentially hazardous, hazardous asteroid of the Apollo group with a mean diameter of approximately 2.5 kilometers. It was discovered on 14 September 1951 by astronomers Albert George Wilson and Rudolf Minkowski at the Palomar Observatory in California, United States. It was named in honor of the National Geographic Society. And so then this one, uh, Betulia, 1580. Uh, 1580 Betulia, provisional designation 1950 KA, is an eccentric carbonaceous asteroid classified as near-Earth object of the Amor group, approximately 4.2 kilometers in diameter. It was discovered on 22 May 1950 by South African astronomer Ernst, Ernest Johnson at the Union Observatory in Johannesburg. The asteroid was named for Betulia Toro, wife of astronomer Samuel Herrick. It's a letter about the asteroid that was named for his wife. <laughs> oh, uh, universal time or unit test. Um, I'm guessing universal time in this in this case. Uh, Universal time notation. Uh, 
Oh, no. It might be unit test. I, I don't know what it means here because that, that is not a universal time format. So possibly unit test. Thanks for trying to figure it out. I, I, I'm not going to dwell on it. If I needed it, I could dig into that. And I'm sure, honestly, if I needed to know uh, for my research, I probably already would know. Because <laughs> I, I assume that I would know something about orbital mechanics and, and it would just be a thing that I knew. Um, writing to H.M. Jeffers at... Lick Observatory in Mount Hamilton, California. Dear Dr. Jeffers, I'm enclosing a copy of our observation ephemeris for Betulia 1580 for the November 19, 1961 opposition. Due to an oversight on our part, the ephemeris was not sent to the Minor Planet Center for publication. We would appreciate any observations you might make as we would like to improve the orbit before Betulia's close approach. Delta equals 0 0.157a sub e in May 1963. Uh, and... Uh, now I'm just, there are a lot of things, there's a, a number of folders about Betulia, um, and I'm guessing that's because it was literally named after his wife. Uh, to E.C. Dougherty, thank you for your letter of April 11, I hear, but I enclose here with copies of our ephemerides as indicated below and hope that they will aid you in getting observations. Uh, so far I haven't actually had any of the enclosures. I'm going to flip, a th flip through a few and see what else we can learn. Because this is a lot of cover letters about, hey, I'm enclosing data on this minor planet. Um, all right. That's what's in that folder. I'm going to pull out... More stuff. When I opened one of the boxes, I found two boxes with their tops cut off inside. I have a feeling this has to do more with the fact that this is an unprocessed collection than anything. Uh, but I thought it was neat, and so I had to bring at least one of those to just kind of share. I opened up a regular archival box, like a banker box, that the, the big boxes that I've shown before. And inside it were two, was two of these. Um, not usual. Uh, but, let's see, I have asteroids general info, I have minor planets general info, I have Variant orbits, con correction to ephemerides. Let's see. Ephemerides, observations, perturbations, integrations. Lots of shuns. Um, physical constants, reference materials. I have what appears to be an entire file drawer of folders. I do not know uh, what is in them. Oh, she was Colombian. Cool. Thank you for looking up information. Uh, I love that I just show something and you all do additional research and then we get to know as a group um, without me having to like take the time and do the boring like I'm searching for things uh, that you can't see. Um, I, I love that we have that sort of a flow here. Um, so what I've pulled out is this entire, like, this is some file folder or uh, file drawer that has been moved into the archives. Um, interestingly, these are not our, not archival folders. Uh, <clears throat> this folder is labeled 72 MPS1D ephemerides. Four 
Russian minor planet ephemerides. Explanation of ephemerides values. The headline contains the number and the name, the photographic magnitude, and the mean anomaly for the third date, the year of the last observation. Then follow six geocentric positions for zero uh, to the h power ut referenced, uh, referred to the mean equinox 1950.0 and the opposition date. The last column contains r, variation of the declension, or sorry, declination, and of the right ascension corresponding to a change of plus one degrees in the mean anomaly. Their quotient and delta distance from Earth equals that letter <laughs> on the third date. I don't know what that letter is. It's a lowercase Greek letter, and I don't know the lowercase Greek letters well enough to know which one that is. If it was uppercase Greek letter, I would know. Um... But I, I don't know what letter that is. Uh, I'm a look. Okay, it's a lowercase row. Um, but again, we have the UT and, and without an explanation of what it means. As you can see, this is not like super fully processed because again, not an archival folder. Metal paper clips still, still in here. Um, so uh, it was noted that this is not a processed collection, but a lot of the stuff had been transferred to uh, archival folders. So these would be observations um, of Betulia. I don't know. The, I don't know what I'm looking at, but they're sometimes rendered weirdly though. Yeah. Yeah, it was Rho. I had to look up because I just I'm not familiar with lowercase Greek letters. I know the uppercase ones, but I, um, it was a quick thing to look up. Geographos observations made at Bern, Switzerland by P. Wild. So lots of like historical data on ob of observations of these minor planets. Um, I don't know. I, I presume these are widely distributed and like other people have access to these historical data sets. Because um, if, and here's an empty folder, like, eh? Uh, if, if the um, historical data sets that are in this archives are not actually available to astronomers beyond them physically coming to our archives and like looking through them, um, I imagine that would uh, potentially hinder science. There, uh, see, it, had this been processed, we would not have. There would just be a note that, like, hey, uh, there were folders with these labels, but nothing in them, rather than the physical folders with nothing in them. Yeah, in theory, there should be copies of these numbers at the Minor Planet Center. Um, and likely there is, and it's probably been updated to make it available uh, online to researchers who have access to sub or subscribe to like certain data sets or things. Um, but I always wonder when I come across a data set in the archives, I'm like, hmm, I wonder if we're the only place that exists. That said, uh, Retaining data is a good thing. And transferring a data set into the archives, good thing. <laughs> um, there are some books in here that appear to be in Greek. I certainly can't read them.
But I'm not afraid of non-English languages. Is it Russian? I guess the letters looked Greek to me at first, but um, yeah, now that I actually look closer, like that is not a Greek letter, that is a Russian letter. Um, so yeah, uh, let's see. I'm going to try again, and we're going to see, uh, not, not Bulgarian this time. The last time I used the translation app, um, it was Bulgarian that I was trying to, to see what things said. Institute of Theoretical Astronomy, Academy of Sciences of the USSR, Ephemeris of Minor Planets for 1983, Ephemerides of Minor Planets for 1983. Oh, well, that part's in English. <laughs> So it is um, a, a published ephemerides of minor planets. Just the USSR uh, publication of the data. You have a lot of Russian astrophysics publications at your office, none of which you can read. Hey. Uh, I don't know that I would ever try to read an entire book by using like the camera automated translation on my phone, but uh, for identifying things for archival purposes, I use it a lot. Uh, automated translation services I use quite a bit for, um, oh dear, did we lose, nope, it's just on there that we lost it. which is fine. I, I saw me frozen on one of the screens, and I was like, did I lose something? Elements of unnumbered minor planets, prepared by Minor Planet Center of the International Astronomical Union at the Cincinnati Observatory, University of Cincinnati, 1961. One of the intriguing and challenging fields of minor planet research is the identification of, of observations made in wild or made in widely separated years as belonging to one and the same planet. To this end, it is helpful to have lists of elements of the unnumbered planets arranged in various ways. The present, long belated, publication presents two such lists one in order of provisional des designations, and another in order of the node. The two lists contain the identical information, each having been printed from the same set of punched cards, but they are in no sense complete. The available data were transferred to punched cards, and these were printed on the IBM 407 tabulator. The careful examination of all the data before the final printing revealed so many errors of various sorts that it would be foolhardy to expect that none remain. I believe we have actually looked at a technical manual for the IBM 407 tabulator. Uh, I can't be certain, but I'd be surprised if we had not at least glimpsed one. Um, we definitely were looking at some early IBM tabulators on uh, a stream last year. The successive columns contain the following information. Planet is the provisional designation, with a few sigma and yo designations at the end of the first list. n is the number of observations upon which the elements are based, 9 meaning 9 or more. g is the magnitude at unit distances, except that for circular orbits, it is the mean, ob uh, the mean opposition magnitude. I don't know what that means. Uh, the epoch is for... O to the H U T. Again, I don't know what U T stands for, except that it, because um, we were unable to confirm whether it was universal time or unit test, the numbers that I saw in the U T column did not seem to conform to universal time, um, except that in some cases it is given as a decimal fraction of the year. Okay, referencing year, so guessing possibly U T is universal time. M is the mean anomaly at the uh, epoch, except that in circular orbits it is the argument of the latitude. Okay, this is pretty dense. 
then follow the argument of perihelion, node, and inclination referred to the equinox uh, EQ. When EQ is blank, this indicates that the elements are referred to by the ecliptic and mean equinox at the beginning of the year. Phi is the angle of the eccentricity, mu is the daily mean motion in seconds of arc, and A is the semi-major axis. The asterisk is a code indicating the source of the elements. Okay. At the end is a collection of known or supposed identities listed chronologically under every designation. The original set of punched cards containing all the elements is on file at the Cincinnati Observatory, and corrections or additions will be made to the set as further information is obtained. Cincinnati Observatory, University of Cincinnati, March 1961. And then we get the list um, that they have very clearly stated what each of these columns mean, and I'm sure you remember just from having me list, er, read that entire paragraph. I certainly remember, but thankfully it's in printed form and it's easy to flip back and check if we wanted to. Um, but we have the planet names here, 1891Z, 1900GA, 1901HF. Um, yeah. So they're all just a, a year, or a four-digit number year, I'm assuming, and a two-letter designation. I think it's easier with names, personally, but there are a lot of objects. So numerical and, and or alphanumerical designations make a lot of sense for identifying the bazillions of objects that are out there in the sky. Oh, this is kind of cool. I don't know. Like, I brought up so much stuff, and honestly, clearly, I did not need to bring up everything I brought up because there's no way we're going to look at most of it. Uh, but I've been having fun with today's. The Names of the Minor Planets. Introduction. Shortly after the Cincinnati Observatory became the Minor Planet Center, a requirement was introduced that the assignment of each new name be accompanied by an explanation of its meaning. This also suggested that a, co a compilation should be prepared which would indicate the meanings of the names which had already been assigned in the past. Entirely by, by coincidence, the Minor Planet Center received a request for information at about the same time from uh, Senor A. Palzi, uh, a. Paluzzi, uh, who had undertaken a similar project in Barcelona, Spain. Uh, he very willingly contributed to this project all of the material which he had painstakingly collected. The major contribution has been made by Mr. R.C. Cameron, formerly of the Cincinnati Observatory and now of Washington, D.C. He has assiduously traced every possible clue and carefully reviewed all the available information so as to weed out errors as much as possible. In spite of these two important contributions, a project such as this is dependent in large part upon bits of information known only to a few persons. We are grateful to all those who have contributed as best they could in response to our requests for information. The material is being published in this preliminary form by the Minor Planet Center with the hope that it will be that it will stimulate others who may be able to fulfill or sorry, may be able to fill in the gaps which still remain. A more permanent form of publication is envisioned if this hope is fulfilled and if there is enough interest to warrant it. Paul Herget a director, the Cincinnati Observatory, 1955, November 30th. Handy fact, Wikipedia now has an entire category, lists of meanings of minor planet names. Awesome. I take, it, I take that to mean that they have uh, successfully proved there was interest. One, series, Piazzi. 1801, January 1, Palermo, Sicily, Roman goddess of corn and harvests, daughter of Ray and Saturn, sister of Juno, Vesta, Jupiter, Neptune, and Pluto, mother of Proserpina by Jupiter, 
Ceres had begged of Jupiter that the triangle-shaped Sicily be placed in the heavens. An early name of the constellation Triangulum was Sicilia. The planet's accidental discovery by Piazzi, 1748-1826, who was not one of the observers then organized for the purpose of searching for a missing planet, um, occurred as follows. Quote, in making his extensive star catalog, he was searching for the star listed by Wollaston as Mayer 87 because it was not in Mayer's zodiacal, uh, zodiacal catalog in the position given, and found a moving star-like object. He at first thought it was a comet. Uh, Bode believed it to be the planet missing between Mars and Jupiter, according to the well-known law that bears his name. And he showed that Wollaston should have recorded the star as uh, Lacaille 87, uh, Leshner Research Surveys of the Minor Planets, page one. Uh, this Wollaston is Francis, father of William H., the discoverer of rhodium and palladium, C2 Pallas. The planet was originally called Ceres Fernandi Fernandia, honoring King Ferdinand III, or sorry, Ceres Ferdinand Ferdinandia, uh, honoring King Ferdinand III of Sicily, who had also been King of Naples, conquered by Napoleon in 1799. This is very extensive. And who was taking refuge in Palermo at the time. The earthly aspect of the name was rejected by astronomers. It was called Hera in Germany. Uh, for a short time, as a result of the discovery, a method of orbit determination from three observations was developed by the eminent K.G. Gauss, resulting in the recovery of the planet in the following year. The chemical element cerium, discovered independently by uh, Berzelius and Klaproth in 1803-4, was named for the planet by the former. Piazzi's name is commemorated by the planet 1000 Piazzia, um, Berzelius, Klaproth, W.H. Wollaston, and Piazzi are all commemorated by craters on the moon. Okay, but now, uh, what was the number for Betulia? Because that's the one that we need to look at. 1580. I wonder, I wonder if it's in here. But simply because it was noted that this was Herrick's wife, I need to see if there is in this explanation 1531 1560 1564 We do not have 1580 <laughs> We got so close but there's no explanation in here of Naming. Wikipedia has it. This minor planet was named after Betulia Toro Herrick, wife of Samuel Herrick, an American astronomer who specialized in celestial mechanics. Herrick had studied the asteroid's orbit and requested the name, along with that of 1685 Toro. The official naming citation was published by the Minor Planet Center in May 1952. I would be curious. Um, I would guess that somewhere in these papers we have uh, that official naming citation. I would, I would be surprised if we don't have it. Um, this is cool. I'm going to read one more and then we're going to need to end because I have pushed over time. Um, but I also feel like reading another one. So... Or maybe a couple. We'll see. Uh, I'm going to read from this page. Because it caught my eye. The very first entry on this page, 343 Ostara. Uh, M. Wolf, 1892, November 15, Heidelberg. Early Teutonic goddess of spring, the Easter rabbit was the escort of Ostara, who thus contributed the name Easter. Uh, German... Ostern. 
I just had to because it's Ostara and uh, uh, 344 de Serrara, a Charlois, 1892, November 15, Nice. Desiree Clary of Marseille, uh, Marseille, who became the wife of General J.B.J. J. Bernadotte. Uh, he became King Charles XIV, John of Sweden and Norway in 1818. She was a former fiancé of Napoleon and is subject of a current novel, Desiree. Um... And then we've got some that it doesn't really have any notation. They've got the names there, but apparently they did not find the reasoning behind 345 uh, Tercinda, um, 347 Pariana, 348 May, um, <clears throat> but we have 349 Dembowska, A. Charlois, 1892, December 9, Nice, Ercole Dembowski, 1812 to 1888, native of Milan, uh, who established a private observatory at Naples, later transferred to Milan. Uh, his careful measures of double stars marked an important stage in this branch of astronomy. 350 Ornamenta, by, uh, found by A. Charlois, 1892, December 14, Nice, in remembrance of the mariner Hornemann, of Holland, whose son is a very zealous member of the Société Astronomique de France. Uh, a, a Gisela, 352 Gisela, is named for Gisela Wolf, the wife of the discoverer. Um, yeah. And, and they can do that because there are so many things for them to discover out in the sky there that they can name them after people as much as they want. Oh, Maximilian Franz Joseph Cornelius Wolff, 21 June 1863 to 3 October 1932, was a German astronomer and a pioneer in the field of astrophotography. He was the chairman of astronomy at the University of Heidelberg and director of the Heidelberg uh, Konigstuhl State Observatory from 1902 until his death in 1932. Gabriella looks cool. Oh, I'll read it. Um, 355 Gabriella, A. Charlois, 1893, January 20th, uh, Nice, named after Gabriella. Ren, uh, Renadol, later Madame Camille Flammarion, in recognition of her zeal as a student of astronomy and an observer at the Observatory uh, de Juvisy, uh, Juvisy. Uh, and my brain immediately translated of into the French, which would be de. But anyway, later she was editor in chief of L'Astronomie. Laureate of the Academy of Sciences of France and Officer of the Legion of Honor. C1021. Well, I mean, we can't leave off without seeing 1021. But then this will be the last. <laughs> All right, 1021. Flammario. M. Wolf, 1924, March 11th, Heidelberg. Named for the French astronomer uh, Camillus Flammarion, 1842 to 1925, he founded the Société Astronomique de France and was the author of many astronomical works. <laughs> the last for now. Um, yeah, this is really cool. Like, really, really cool. I had not paid this much attention to the actual, like, naming and discovery of minor planets. Like, I would have called them asteroids myself. Like, my brain goes there, but clearly a broader category. Um, but yeah, I, I never had really paid that much attention to 
minor planets. So uh, this is really neat. Um, and I I'm really, really happy that we spent some time today looking at this. Um, I mean, as I said, what, alas, for the linear passage of time, indeed, key squared. Uh, what originally caught my eye and made me pull things from this collection was um, the fact that he had consulted on the 1951, The Day the Earth Stood Still. We spent a good hour looking at that material at the beginning of stream. Um, we never even got to the Project Mercury stuff. There's Project Mercury stuff in here, NASA's Project Mercury, that we will need to just revisit at some point because I'm sure it will be just as interesting. And I think <clears throat> this was the kind of thing I was looking for on the minor planets. Um, we had a lot of ephemerides mentions. We had a lot of like, I'm sure the other boxes had plenty of like statistical data and observations of the minor planets. This. This is the kind of thing that I was interested in from the minor planets. Like, A, what are minor planets? But then um, this is documentation of the mid-1950s when they decided to put together information on why are they named what they're named. Um, and I think that that is just awesome and a great footnote in history. Plus, we had, um, we had the lovely... Uh, correspondence with R.H. Goddard, as well as other sort of famous people in rocketry and, and astrodynamics. And um, I had a great time with stream today. Uh, before we go, let me look and just confirm next week on October 5th, we will be looking at the Hard Times Blues collection, uh, which is a collection of material about a production of a play. And that play is about a sort of iconic figure in the history of Virginia Tech, um, uh, who was known as uh, Hard Times, Floyd Hard Times Mead, uh, Floyd Mead, was sort of the original mascot for Virginia Tech sports. Um, he used to bring a turkey, a live turkey, that he, a trained turkey to the games. Um, I don't know much about him beyond the fact that he brought a live trained turkey to the games and uh, our mascot is a turkey to this day. Um, so I'm interested to see what we learn about him and about this play that was written about him. Um, and that is what we're going to look at next week. Um, and then coming up later, uh, after that, I have a glass lantern slide collection, then an archi architecture collection, and then um, uh, some pulp fantasy and horror uh, just in time for Halloween. So um, those are things that are coming, but let me look and see who we're going to raid um, today. And yeah, I don't see, well, fine. <laughs> I don't see that the aquarium is live. So we're going to head on over and say hello to Stephen Joys again, uh, because Stephen is amazing. And um, totally worth following if you're not already. Um, Steven is currently playing a game called Crone Escher, which is a, um, an Escher-esque uh, sort of puzzle solver game that is with, also has an element of like time travel involved. Anyway, um, it's a good puzzler. Uh, I do want to say thank you all for joining me today. Um, I had a blast. Um, hopefully I will see you again for a future Archival Adventures. Um, I should be back next Wednesday, as I said, with that theatrical collection. 
Uh, but until I see you next, I hope that you get out there and continue exploring history. Thank you so very much for joining me, and I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Bye.